Okay, so finally, let's uh, get into some solution architecture around Amazon S3. So, a common question is uh, how do you expose ecstatic objects to your clients? A option that's uh, very simple uh, would be to have an EC2 instance that's uh, going to be publicly accessible and uh, maybe you will have an EBS volumes or maybe it will be an instance store and the data will be stored on it it's cheap it works uh, it doesn't scale very well and it's not very highly available but uh, it works okay it's only way of doing things a more scalable way uh, what's a more uh, a more global way would be to have like the cloud front in front of this so cloud front talks to ec2 uh, talks to ebs and the cloud front gives us a really good benefit is that uh, now our data is going to be cast across the global as network of aws which gives us uh, clients uh, to all around the world some ability to get the objects maybe a little bit closer to them so this uh, has a better global availability and still in the back end it's not perfect because in case uh, our EC2 instances fail uh, then CloudFront will report uh, it that it's unavailable and if it's not cast in its AS network so it's an improvement but uh, not perfect then uh, we can go to a full-blown solution improvement uh, full-blown solution where like uh, we have cloud fronts in front of an application load balancer uh, that has a fleet of EC2 instances behind another scaling group and then these EC2 instances need to share some data they need to have the, like the uh, some same access to the same files so EBS uh, does not work in this file okay in this case in this use case uh, and when and then we have to use something like the EFS as a network file system and the cool thing about the EFS uh, that's uh, a, a network file system it's a POSIX, com POSIX compliant and it does only for the Linux instances so it's so it scales so this works but this is quite expensive also uh, I would say I would say that the last kind of solution that you would run into would be CloudFront directly in front of S3 uh, and uh, and this works great and if you have a static objects in S3 that are pretty big that doesn't require them to be updated uh, very often so as you can see there's a different ways of exposing static objects and there's not there's there's uh, there's not right way of doing it uh, obviously i think the preferred way is going to be the one with the cloud front and s3 but it still depends on your architecture your requirements and the way your application is going to be designed moving on moving on with uh, s3 i just said that there is no indexing facility in s3 so you cannot search your s3 buckets for an object and so the right way of doing things would be uh, would be to index objects in DynamoDB. so you have the rights into uh, amazon s3 uh, and uh, so and then maybe through some s3 event notification your lambda function is being triggered and it will read part of the file row the entire file but most likely part of the file using a byte range fetch and then it will insert some metadata dynamodb table and it's uh, really good to have DynamoDB table because uh, from there we could create an API to search for the object metadata for example if you have right index you can search by date you can look at the total search uh, used by a customer you can list all the objects with an attribute and uh, you can find all the objects uploaded within the within a date range uh, so having the data in DynamoDB opens up a lot more solution to search into Amazon S3 and uh, they are very very good combo usually linked with the lambda function so finally some of the best practice some of the best practice we have on amazon is to separate the dynamic content from the static content uh, i think uh, this makes a lot of sense but it's uh, good to outline in incorrectly Okay, so if you make a DNS request to Route 53, you can be redirected to the dynamic content to, for example, your REST API, your REST HTTP server. So this could be a, um, this could be an ALB bus, EC2, API Gateway plus Lambda. It really depends. Uh, we have seen this.
uh, we have seen this uh, uh, at uh, length already in this course but the idea is that you get all the dynamic content through this route uh, there's little to no caching maybe and uh, you get access to some fresh uh, small data uh, so you can have the database layer to DynamoDB you can have a caching or session layer index in DynamoDB this is just one architecture with the idea uh, with this idea I want you to remember that it's going to be a more dynamic route uh, where there's going to be tons of requests and for the static content things that doesn't change very often uh, then usually Usually, uh, you go through a CDN layer, cloud delivery network layer, such as CloudFront to uh, cache a content at the edge and uh, save some cost and improve the performance. Uh, there's going to be more for your HTML files, uh, your big files, your videos and so on. And all this static content needs to be stored onto a layer that scales really well, such as Amazon S3. It's uh, very possible that your dynamic content has to interact with Amazon S3. Uh, by uploading some files directly in it it's possible it's possible definitely and then as i said we can react to changes happening in your amazon s3 bucket using a lambda function that uh, reacts to these events and uh, the lambda function could index all the data into dynamodb uh, which could in turn help the dynamic route so that means that uh, you know even it's the uh, like static and dynamic they can be definitely linked to one another Finally, we don't have to go through the CloudFront to get access to our S3 bucket unless uh, we set up an OAI. And but if we have want, uh, then we can use a pre-signed URL to access our S3 buckets and uh, get the content right away from it. And we have seen this when we were trying to upload files sufficiently directly into our S3 bucket uh, when we were trying to download files as well in a more performant fashion uh, without going to without going for some proxies etc etc so that's it for the actually the solution architectures but hopefully it starts shedding some light into how you should think as a solution architect professional the exam will ask you stuff like this so it's a good that you visualize this infrastructure and architecture is much as possible as much as possible and remember separating dynamic and static content in is uh, some of the best practices uh, that's it uh, and uh, i will see you in the next lecture